Good morning, everybody. It's a beautiful morning in Washington, D.C. after the monsoons seem to have relieved us uh, of some of the rain. It's a beautiful day. My name's Kim Holmes. I'm the executive vice president of the Heritage Foundation. I'd like to welcome all of you here. And for all of you who are watching online, I would ask uh, that if any of you have not already done so, please to turn off your cell phone ringers. That would be a great courtesy to us. It's a great honor uh, for all of us uh, to uh, welcome today Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, to speak at the Heritage Foundation on the importance of free market principles in American health care. We all know that health care is a vital topic in America today. Americans care a great deal about it, about where it's going in the future. Uh, it clearly will be an election, uh, an issue in the upcoming elections. And we are very honored and very fortunate to have the Secretary with us today to provide his perspective. So please now welcome the Heritage Foundation's President, Kay Coles-James, who will make some introductory remarks and then introduce Secretary Hazard. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation. It's been a busy morning already, and uh, we are in for a real treat right now. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce my friend this morning and to welcome him back to the Heritage Foundation. For those of you who may not know, uh, Alex Azar was sworn in as President Trump's Secretary of Health and Human Services in January 2018. The Department of Health and Human Services is the largest cabinet department in the federal government by spending with a budget of, wait for it, 1.2 trillion in 2018. It is charged with enhancing and protecting the health and well-being of Americans. The department encompasses not just healthcare programs such as Medicare and Medicaid, but also scientific institutions such as CDC, NIH, FDA, human services programs uh, such as the Administration for Children and Families, and preparedness and response work to protect Americans from natural disasters, infectious disease, and other threats. Secretary Azar has spent his career working in senior healthcare leadership roles in both the public and private sectors. His current tenure at HHS is a second tour of duty at the department. He served as HHS's general counsel from 2001 to 2005, and then as deputy secretary, the department's number two official and chief operating officer. During his time as deputy secretary, he played key roles in international affairs, 
global health diplomacy, implementation of new Medicare prescription drug programs, public health emergency, preparedness and response efforts, and food and drug regulation, full plate. He also led the department through several successful management and operational transformations. He joined the private sector in 2007, moving to Indiana with his wife and children. And it is my pleasure to welcome here today the uh, Secretary of Health and my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. It's uh, it's great to be here with so many so many great friends, not just Kay. But uh, I'm looking around. I'm seeing so many friendly faces in the audience already. I hope it remains friendly during Q&A, Kay. We'll see. Um, but thank you for that very kind introduction. And it, it's always an honor um, to be introduced by, by a friend, but also by a member of the HHS family. Um, I had not known that uh, Kay got one of her big starts in her career from uh, over, at, over at HHS. Delighted to be here at the Heritage Foundation again. Um, Heritage has played such a vital role in so many of the important public policy debates of the last several decades. Many administrations, including this one, have benefited from the work of the Heritage Foundation on public policies that reflect principles of free enterprise, limited government, individual freedom, traditional American values, and a strong national defense. Today, I'd like to share how some of these principles can help us address one of the most significant public policy issues of our time, reforming the American healthcare system. America's healthcare system is huge and immensely complex. It's the single largest sector of our economy, consuming more than one-sixth of our GDP. The Department of Health and Human Services itself, as Kay mentioned, is gigantic, with over 80,000 employees and a budget, I hate to break this to you, Kay, it's now $1.3 trillion, uh, more than 300 individual programs. Standing alone, we would be the fifth largest government on earth. We're bigger than the United Kingdom. But just because we have a complex and very large system and complex challenges does not mean that there are no simple principles for reform. One of America's greatest leaders, Ronald Reagan, applied common sense solutions to the supposedly intractable challenges of his time, like an overly complicated tax code and a bloated, broken welfare system. Like President Trump, he saw, he saw straight through how Washington works, and he had a pithy description of how problems are usually handled here. Quote, government's view of the economy could be summed up in a few short phrases, he said. If it moves, tax it. If it keeps moving, regulate it. And if it stops moving, subsidize it. <laughs> For too long, that has more or less been the federal government's approach to health care. We saw it most recently with the Affordable Care Act, which imposed a new tax or regulation, or sometimes both, on just about every moving part in our health care system. There was even a tax on not buying the right kind of health insurance until President Trump and Congress repealed it. The Trump administration's first instincts are the opposite of the big government nightmare that President Reagan described. If something in our health care system isn't working, we'll see if there's a regulation in the way. If prices are high, we'll see if there's a tax involved. If prices keep rising, we'll see if there's a subsidy driving them. We all come by these lessons in different ways. As many of you may know, I went to that bastion of conservative free market thinking, Yale Law School. <laughs> many land use controls, my, my, I had a land use control professor there, um, not that I was so interested in land use controls in law school, but just a brilliant professor, Robert Ellickson. And he used to offer us a Reagan-esque lesson. He'd say, when you take Metro North in from New Haven to Manhattan, and you see land with burnout buildings on it or land that's not being put to its highest and best use, even if only as a parking lot. Ask yourself the following question. How's the government involved here? That's always been a guiding principle for me in thinking about economics and regulation. When things don't work the way they should, when we ask why the rest of the economy is fully digitized while healthcare isn't, when we wonder why healthcare lacks the dynamism and consumerism of the rest of the economy, I look for culprits. And so very often the culprit is government action, sometimes from decades 
or even a century ago. In some cases, that means the gov that government action may often be needed to fix what government itself broke. Sometimes the necessary government action may be strong medicine because markets have become so distorted or so diminished. And sometimes our solutions, because of political realities, may be subject to the law of second best, to use law and economics speak. Always, however, our actions will be aimed at building markets and competition, restoring price signals and incentives, and empowering consumers through choice, rather than having government decide what is best for the individual. Today, I want to talk about how these principles apply to a few of the priorities that I've laid out with the president for HHS. First, reforming the individual market for insurance. Second, bringing down the high price of prescription drugs. And third, transforming our healthcare system into one that pays for value. Let's begin with the individual insurance market. The Affordable Care Act created a thicket of subsidies, regulations, and taxes to help Americans without employer insurance secure coverage on the individual market. In theory, it was supposed to not only expand this kind of private coverage, but to bring costs down. It has come up short on both objectives. According to an HHS analysis from 2013, the year before the ACA's most significant new regulations took full effect, through 2017, individual premiums in 39 states rose an average of 105%. They have more than doubled. As prices skyrocketed, it is little surprise that the real market for individual insurance, that is the part that is not supported by the ACA's huge subsidies, has actually shrunk. From 2016 to 2017, HHS found that the number of unsubsidized enrollees dropped by about 20%. The only factor keeping the individual market alive is the tens of billions of dollars of subsidies supplied directly to insurers each year. The fundamental flaw of the ACA is that it narrowed the competition for insurance options and laid down heavy-handed controls on the prices that could be charged. One of the most notable price controls doesn't, I think, get enough attention. In a free market, young people can buy individual insurance for about one-sixth of what it costs older people, because younger people use fewer health care resources. But the ACA imposed a price floor. Younger Americans must be charged at least one-third of what older Americans pay. This kind of price control chokes off private markets. Young people are, by definition, getting less than they pay for, so they opt out of the system. And then that's not a good deal for older Americans either, because they're the only ones left paying into the system, so their premiums rise. Congress created this broken system, and it's going to take an act of Congress to fix it. But we have flexibility within the law to try out some free market reforms, and we've done so in two significant ways so far this year. Soon after I arrived at HHS, we issued a proposed rule to expand access to short-term insurance policies that are free of the ACA's strictures, and as a result, cost as little as one-third the price. The previous administration limited access to these plans in the hope that they could drive more people back into the ACA market. Remember, if it's still moving, regulate it. We care deeply about consumers having the information they need. So we made it clear that these short-term plans aren't for everyone, but Americans deserve all the affordable alternatives possible. Second, earlier this summer, the Department of Labor, my friend Alex Acosta, finalized a rule to significantly expand access to association health plans under which small businesses and individuals running their own companies can come together to buy insurance. The number of small businesses choosing to offer insurance to their employees has been declining for years but getting government out of the way has the potential to reverse that trend. Another aspect of the Affordable Care Act that has been of great concern is its substantial expansion of the Medicaid program. To the extent that the ACA does cover more Americans, it is mostly due to the expansion of this taxpayer-funded program. Medicaid has historically played an important role, covering low-income mothers and their children, the elderly, and the disabled. But the ACA expanded the program well beyond these populations, making it a free source of coverage for 15 million new, able-bodied adults, including many without any children. Perversely, the ACA offers more generous support for states to ensure these populations, currently covering more than 90% of the cost, than it does for traditional, vulnerable Medicaid populations. Supporting legislation to undo those perverse incentives is a priority for this administration. But in the meantime, we want to rethink how Medicaid serves these able-bodied, 
working age adults, which is why we've encouraged states to consider work and community engagement requirements for these populations. For these enrollees, Medicaid should be not just a government insurance card, but a pathway out of poverty to fuller purpose and better health. This vision for Medicaid laid down by our CMS administrator, Seema Verma, reflects our general principles for programs that support low-income Americans. Programs should take a holistic approach to better health and greater self-sufficiency. They should, to the extent possible, avoid work disincentives and income cliffs, and they should offer states flexibility in achieving these goals. The importance of state flexibility goes beyond Medicaid. President Trump's budget proposes to replace the entirety of the ACA subsidy structure as well as the Medicaid expansion with a flexible block grant. As many of you know, this is similar to a pro proposal put forth by state and think tank leaders, including some heritage scholars in this room today. It harkens back to the new federalism approach of President Reagan, which was inspired by the Heritage Foundation's mandate for leadership. Since the Reagan administration, significant amounts of HHS's so social service programs have been distributed by block grant, freeing states to use funds in, a way, in ways that meet their needs. What President Trump has proposed is to apply state flexibility to much, much larger entitlements, a generationally significant shift back to the states. Now, I realize that proposing significant reform for two major individual entitlement programs is the kind of thing that Heritage Fellows might do in one morning before coffee. <laughs> but it's not very often that we have a president who is willing to call for such radical and yet necessary reforms. The president has also called for historic changes to another piece of our healthcare system, our market for prescription drugs. American private industry has produced so many of the world's miracle drugs, like cures for hepatitis C. Today, we're on the verge of stunning advances in the war on cancer, including treatments that use our own immune systems to fight the disease. We also have access to cheap, effective treatments through the world's strongest market for generic drugs, which actually delivers us lower prices for many generics than European patients pay. But in some important ways, we do not have a real market for prescription drugs. One fundamental aspect of a market is generally that if you cut your price, more people will buy your product. With apologies to the PhDs in the audience, you don't need to be an economist to know that. And yet, that is not, by and large, how drug prices work in America. If a company lowers its price for a given drug, the drug can actually become less desirable vis-a-vis -vis its competition. Obviously, consumers wouldn't look at it that way. But they don't decide which drugs are available on formulary and at what cost. That is decided by insurers, employers, and pharmacy benefit managers. This could work well if these parties' incentives were aligned, but all of them are paid as a percentage of a drug's list price. When prices drop, the consumer may save, but those actually negotiating for the consumer make less money. President Trump has put this whole system on notice. We have the power to break up this arrangement ourselves through administrative action because it relies on a loophole in federal law that allows these otherwise highly regulated entities to essentially double deal. Already, we have seen drug companies hit pause on price increases or actually cut prices, understanding that we are on the verge of significant and transformative reform in the drug pricing system in the United States. Fixing the broken incentives around list prices is one piece of the president's plan. But a real market also requires that consumers, competitors, and other private actors are pushing down prices. The three other elements of our plan are therefore giving private negotiators more power within our system to negotiate with drug companies, empowering consumers to bring down out-of-pocket costs, and stoking competition in drug markets. Now, delivering on this plan will involve taking some steps that may be unexpected. It took some by surprise last week when I directed the Food and Drug Administration to stand up a working group to examine how importing drugs from other countries could help, access, help address at patient access problems caused by spikes in drug prices. This shouldn't necessarily have been a surprise because the President and I have been very clear when we rolled out our drug pricing blueprint earlier this year. We are open to all solutions that put American patients first, meaning they're safe, effective, and respectful of patient choice and the incentives that drive American innovation. 
The FDA will be looking at situations where we have good reason to think importation could fit those three requirements. Where a company that's a sole manufacturer of a drug in the United States takes a big price increase on a drug that no longer has any patent protections or exclusivities. Because there are no IP rights involved, manufacturers in other countries could help introduce new competition without undermining incentives for innovation. We've long had concerns about how broad-based importation, open borders for drugs, could raise safety issues. But especially within the bounds of this precise proposal, we believe it may be possible to introduce more competition while keeping one of the crown jewels of our system, our closed distribution network, entirely safe. Thankfully, we do have successful competition and negotiation in parts of our drug markets, including within Medicare, where Part D plans aggressively negotiate with drug companies to keep costs down. Those insisting that we must have, quote, direct negotiation between the government and drug companies aren't really interested in negotiation. Generally, they're calling for the federal government to impose a single formulary for all Medicare patients with no right to choose another option and use the possibility of denying coverage of certain drugs to drive price down. This doesn't respect patient access and violates one of the core principles of American healthcare. In our system, you have exit rights. To coin a phrase, the way our system works, if you don't like your plan, you don't have to keep it. <laughs> we know that we can respect this principle while expanding coverage and bringing down prices because we've done so in the past. Many of you here will remember the complaints during the 2000s that Medicare Part D's negotiation system would be a giveaway to drug companies. But because it harnesses market forces and has driven thriving generic drug competition, Part D has actually come in tens of billions of dollars under budget while providing seniors with the life-saving drugs that they need. Let me repeat that because I know that those words are never heard in Washington, tens of billions of dollars under budget. The good news is that there is certainly room for improvement even within Medicare Part D. Some rules currently stand in the way of plans doing the best job they can to negotiate for seniors and for us as taxpayers, and we look forward to reforming them to generate savings for seniors and for us. Part D has proven that market forces can deliver benefits to our seniors at a sustainable cost. Unfortunately, elsewhere in our programs, we have made very significant, important commitments to pay for the health care of older Americans without setting up a system that can sustainably deliver them. Margaret Thatcher once quipped that the problem with socialism is that eventually you run out of other people's money. We at HHS are, to are told something every year by our actuaries in rather more complex terms. But there's no way around it. Medicare is running out of other people's money, and those other people happen to be our children. The Medicare Hospital Insurance Trust Fund will be out of money by 2026, necessitating large tax increases or benefit cuts. Meanwhile, the Medicaid program is on track to consume an ever larger share of federal and state government spending. It already takes up more than one third of many state budgets. President Trump has made a solemn vow to protect these programs for today's seniors and future generations. To do that, we need to reform these programs in the way we know works, introducing market-based competition. For a while now, there's been a consensus that something simply has to change about how these programs work. As healthcare has grown more and more complex, the traditional model of paying doctors based on the volume of procedures that they perform, as much of Medicare does, has made less and less sense. There's been some progress in the private market on moving payment from, quote, volume to value, and some useful innovations within Medicare. But everyone agrees we've got a long way to go, and with today's demographic and fiscal trends, we don't have a lot of time to accomplish the changes that we need. The problem with many efforts to pay for value is that they have assumed central planners, the government, have to be the ones to determine value. But if the government writes the equation for value, the answer is never going to be cheap or simple, and special interests will find a way to manipulate it. Americans know there's a better way. In every other sector of our economy, we don't expect the government to set prices. We rely on the free exchange of information among buyers and sellers between competing interests to do it. We can get better outcomes from our healthcare system at a lower cost by putting patients, not government, in charge. Since arriving at HHS, I've laid out a vision for how to get there, which includes putting patients in charge of their own health data, boosting price and quality transparency, pioneering new payment models within Medicare and Medicaid, 
and undoing regulations that are impeding this transition and care coordination in particular. As I said earlier, when there's a place that our healthcare system isn't meeting people's needs, the first question that I ask is what might government be doing to prevent private actors from solving it? As it turns out, when it comes to paying for value, government is doing a great deal to get in the way. One issue is just the sheer complexity of our billing systems. Earlier this month, under the leadership of Administrator Verma, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services proposed some of the most fundamental reforms to Medicare that we've seen in decades, including measures to simplify how doctors are paid for basic evaluation visits. Currently, there are five different levels of visits, which allow doctors to get paid more if the visit is coded as more complex. Five levels may not sound like much to you, but you don't just get to check one of those boxes. You've got to exhaustively document the characteristics of the visit that render it the type you've selected. Well, CMS has now proposed to reduce that burden dramatically by just going to two payment levels, a change that has been hailed by doctors across the political spectrum as a seismic shift. Just this change could save clinicians an average of 51 hours of paperwork per year more than a whole work week of time that they could use to deliver better quality, more personalized care to their patients. Another key way to, to deliver value and bring down costs is better coordination among providers. Value-based payment, for instance, means paying providers based on the outcomes of their services, not the volume. But if someone's going to take on the risk of healthcare outcomes, they're going to want to have some control over the inputs. A surgeon, for instance, cannot guarantee a good result just through their performance in the operating room. Quality rehab services will play an important role too. But current interpretations of a number of federal laws stand in the way of healthcare providers, especially physicians, reaching these kind of sensible cost-saving arrangements. That's why HHS is beginning a comprehensive review of regulations that impede the ability of doctors, hospitals, and payers to coordinate in delivering better care at a lower cost. CMS kicked off this effort by releasing a request for information regarding the Stark Law, which prevents physicians from making referrals to other doctors or practices with which they have a financial relationship unless certain enumerated exemptions apply. In the coming months, under the leadership of my Deputy Secretary, Eric Hargan, HHS will be releasing requests for information regarding the anti-kickback statute, HIPAA, and a federal privacy law called 42 CFR Part 2. Following those requests for information, we will be taking regulatory action to reform these rules. As it happens, current interpretations of the two privacy laws I mentioned are not just impeding value-based arrangements in healthcare. They can also get in the way of communities and families working together to combat our country's crisis of opioid addiction, another top priority for President Trump. The laws that I've mentioned, like our healthcare programs, are decades old. As the cost of American healthcare has kept rising without commensurate increases in quality, it simply shouldn't have taken us this long to stop talking about fixing them and actually get down to doing it. But one of the ironies of our politics today is that we who call ourselves conservatives are the ones who recognize the need for change. The political heirs of those who call themselves progressives too often no longer believe in progress and instead propose expanding, even ossifying programs that date back more than half a century. Today, fixing American healthcare requires disrupting government dictated systems building new ones that encourage choice and competition, and heeding the principles that I've laid out today. Letting private innovators chart the future and refusing easy gimmicks takes courage. But it's leaders with that kind of courage who have kept America exceptional. And President Trump possesses that kind of courage. With an openness to change, to innovation, and to real economic dynamism under this president, we can secure American exceptionalism in healthcare for generations to come. Thank you again for having me here today, and I'm looking forward to sitting with Kay and having a discussion with you. Okay. Thank you. And again, welcome to Heritage. We're delighted to have you here again. Um, you mentioned that I'm a former alum of HHS, and also in the Bush administration, I had the opportunity to be director of the Office of Personnel Management. But you may not know, we also share another title in common, and that is that I'm a former Secretary of Health at the state level. <laughs> 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 
So with that, I know how important personnel is in putting together a high-performing team to get all of what you just talked about done. And I know that in this town and in this environment, that's been a little difficult. But could you just give us an update on how you're doing and what kind of principles you're applying to uh, sort of uh, put your team together? Um, so as, as Kay just said, uh, people is policy. Uh, you know, it's a bit of a cliche, but cliches usually have the benefit of being accurate. Uh, so as I've as I built the structure that I'm using at HHS, what I've tried to do is ensure that we have the ability to perform on those over 300 programs and $1.3 trillion budget to make sure we're able to deliver and operate well. But I hope you heard from my remarks, I'm talking about major, fundamental, comprehensive transformation of core elements of our healthcare system and our human services approach. That is very hard to do. There are very few leaders who can both run the perform and transform at the same time. So what I've done is created four senior advisor positions reporting directly to me, individuals to drive each of the four key transformation areas that we're focused on. So that they're just, that's all they think about. They wake up in the morning and they're not worried about whatever the latest regulation is that has to get out, the payment rule or FDA approving a drug, et cetera. They focus only on that transformation agenda. And I brought in leaders who are significant C-suite CEO type leaders with significant private sector experience who know the depth of the economics around the programs that we are regulating. It's that insight that allows us to really break down these systems and change them. I'll give you an example. I, of course, have spent, spent a decade in the pharmaceutical industry and learned from that where the money flows, where the money is, what are the key steps that can be taken. You know, we put the president's blueprint out on drug pricing, and some people who don't understand the complexity of that system were maybe a little bit uh, um, uh, wondering what was, you know, where's the big move? Where's the gimmick in there? Mm -hmm. Well, the folks who actually, I heard this, the, the folks who actually know the finances of the drug companies were like, oh no, <laughs> um, he knows where the money is. It's, it's in there. He's like, all these little, all these 52 things in there, they're actually very targeted approaches. They get at all the incentives and all the levers. And I've got Dan Best, who ran uh, one of the biggest, PB, actually the biggest Part D plan in the country from a PBM perspective, who added tremendous insight about how plans work. And I've done the same on the individual market reform, on the opioid crisis, and on value-based transformation. Leaders who have a history in industry of transforming complex businesses, so. Well, on behalf of the American people, thank you so much uh, for putting together that team and for actually doing things that work. Uh, some of the questions I have are from people in the audience. Some are uh, my own. But I have one from my friend, Grace Marie Turner, who's here. And um, my friend also. <laughs> absolutely. She and I have been doing healthcare policy in this town for, I don't want to say how many years. It's been way too many. Um, but Grace wants to know, uh, the House just voted to provide many options to people with health savings accounts, as you know, something I care a great deal about. Uh, how do you see this helping people who have been so hurt by Obamacare's high costs and rising deductibles? So it's no secret we're incredibly supportive of health savings accounts as a tool for providing access to patients. Because um, remember, there's, I think, one of the things that got forgotten about what we did with the Medicare Modernization Act, where we created health savings accounts in the first place, was the combination of high deductible health care plans with a health savings account. Okay? The point wasn't simply high deductible plans to shove burden on the patient. The point was high deductible plans that then had that deductible able to be filled by tax-free savings or employer-funded savings that could be used against that. And I will tell you, I lived for a decade with an HSA. I saw my own behaviors change, knowing once that money hit, my, hit that account, I just used the word my, that was my money. That was dear to me, and I was very, very, very careful about spending it and made, you know, made choices that, you know, uh, you might not think from income level or anything. I was very cautious about spending that. I became a real consumer. Um, I've told the story before. I, my doctor had wanted me to get an echocardiogram uh, uh, and stress test just as a routine thing. They wanted to charge me 5500 bucks. 
Now, normally, if I had a regular old PPO plan, I would have said, ah, sure. go for it. I, <laughs> it was an hour-long negotiation on that one, eventually leading me to tear the wristband off my wrist and walk out of the hospital and say, that's outrageous. I'm not paying the cash discount of $3,500 for it. Um, I wouldn't have done that without my HSA. And that was money my company had put in there, but it was mine mm -hmm. <laughs> at that point. And so uh, the, we are very supportive of efforts to strengthen HSAs, to allow more money to be put in there, to, to enable the HSA money to be used for more preventive services, to expand the reach of those, because I think it is a critical counterpart to high deductible plans, and it's a critical element of how we bring that kind of consumerism to a third-party payer system. Oh, I have seen that behavior play out in my own family. When it's my money my kids are spending, it's one thing. When it's theirs, it's totally different. Uh, it, when it's your money, it really can affect behavior. Um, I have a topic that I'm interested in. When in Virginia, uh, Virginia was one of the states where health and welfare were under the same secretariat, and so I'm a little interested in uh, some of the initiatives that are coming out of the administration on welfare reform. I know that the president has, uh, has said that uh, he wants to do something in this space, and I know that uh, you are busy working on some of those initiatives at uh, HHS. Could you share a little bit of that with us? Sure. I think it's important to start from principles uh, mm -hmm. when talking about the human services, public welfare programs that we run. And the way I approach, as I mentioned briefly in my remarks, these, these public welfare programs is, first, if possible, they should be of temporary duration. So they should be to help people get out of poverty, if at all possible. Uh, they should be holistic. We, we end up creating these programs as rifle shots, this welfare program, this need, that need. We don't do a good job building a wraparound of services that help lift somebody up out of poverty to get them on their own feet There's and may have conflicting rules, conflicting approaches. So I want a more holistic approach. I am also not a believer in cliffs, in benefit cliffs. Um, it should never be the case that you make more money by not working than working. And so we need to smooth out those benefit curves so that the individual always has the financial incentive to get to work and get a job. You should never, there was a story in the New York Times about, um, oh goodness, I think four, five, six months ago about someone up in New Hampshire who deliberately managed her Uber driving to keep under the Medicaid expansion population income cap to do that. I, but we shouldn't, listen, she's being a rational actor. I'm not faulting her. We shouldn't build a system that, creates that incentive. We should smooth those out. We need to reform our TANF system, which Heritage was so critical in creating the temporary assistance for needed, needy families. The welfare reform program pioneered by people like Tommy Thompson and then implemented actually under President Bill Clinton. But right now what's happened is many states are gaming the system. And that extraordinary work they did in Virginia. Yes, yes way, of yeah. course. Um, but they're, they're, many states now are gaming the system. Um, they're, 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 counting, they're counting people who aren't actually working. They're taking them off the rules to count, to count them against their, the mandates. They've figured out over time how to, how to work the system. Uh, they're not devoting effort and money towards getting people training and education and get them out into the workforce, which was the point of TANF. We have a marriage disincentive. You know, our program actually, um, it creates a higher work participation rate if you're married than if you're single. So what do, what do a lot of states do? Um, they basically get the married people off the rolls so they can oh. qualify for their work participation rates and then favor singles. So we, we've got to fix all of that. I am so glad you brought that up. Here in, at, at Heritage and for me, for most of the time I've been involved in these, these uh, public policy issues, um, there's a great deal of consensus that comes around the work piece and the pride that comes with getting a job and working. But I'll tell you, it's off fully hard sometimes to convince policymakers about the marriage penalty and the need to address that. So I am so grateful to you for doing that. Um, what else are you all doing on that issue at HHS? Um, so we, as we look at our programs, even like in Medicaid, uh, so one of the things I mentioned in my remarks is we have been very supportive of us with these able-bodied adults. It's a very different kind of population than we're used to in the Medicaid program. Medicaid has historically been for children, the, the, the parents, the single parents of children, the disabled, and the elderly. Now we're basically, it's an income program for individuals who are able-bodied up to a certain income level um, who could, there's no reason they necessarily 
couldn't be working. Um, and so we have been supportive of state efforts to impose community engagement or work requirements. Now, we've tried to be sensible there. So if an individual, for instance, is, is single, has young children, we exemptions. Mm -hmm. right? we're, not try, we're, not, we're trying to be very sensible. The, I've, I've, I've told the team as we work on this, the mantra should be common sense, that anything a state does here, people ought to look, oh, yeah, that's, you know, that, that's not some unreasonable, crazy thing. Uh, if you can't get a job, you, people don't talk about this. The programs we've approved, you can volunteer. If you, if just 20 hours of volunteer work. You don't, it doesn't have to be getting a job. It can be getting education as part of it. Um, it can be child care. It can be taking care of child. Uh, so, you know, we suffered one blow in a district court in litigation. We are undeterred. We are proceeding forward. We are fully committed to work requirements and community participation requirements in the Medicaid program. Uh, we will continue to litigate. We will continue to approve plans. We are continuing to work with states and, and we'll drive forward. We'll take any learnings, obviously, from that piece of litigation with which we disagree. But we'll, um, we're, we're, we're moving forward. You know, I saw the pride of work in people's eyes uh, as they um, they had their first job. Many for the, you know, in families that for generations had not worked. Work is not a penalty. It is amazing to me that some perceive it that way, and I am so particularly grateful that that you're recognizing that uh, even in communities where. Uh, unemployment rates are such that work may be hard to find. There's ample opportunity to volunteer, uh, to give back something to the community that are providing resources for you. And uh, we are particularly grateful, too, that you are focused on uh, eliminating marriage penalties that exist within law uh, because marriage matters and it makes strong families and helps lift people out of poverty. Um, you can tell these are subjects and issues that are very near and dear to the hearts of the people here within this building and to me personally, but I am very aware of your time constraints today and just want to thank you on behalf of the uh, scholars, researchers, writers um, for, we have a problem here. Hello. Sounds the same to me. What about you? On behalf of the scholars, researchers, writers um, here at the Heritage Foundation, thank you so much for the work that you're done. You are always welcome here with, um, to uh, share with us your new ideas. And uh, I want to thank uh, our audience that's here and thank our audience uh, online as well as uh, that are participating with us by way of television today. Thank you for being here and welcome back anytime you want to come. Thank you very thank much. You so Thanks much. to all of you. Thank you.